Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, my guest Molly and I are going to be talking about books that we like to dive into in the fall. Bring on the witches, the vampires, the paranormal, and the dead. The werewolves, the ghosts. Oh, yeah. So, are you a seasonal reader, typically, Molly? Not really. I'm more haphazard than that. I just kind of read anything whenever. Okay. I definitely am a seasonal vibe reader. I I like to pick up certain books at certain times of the year. So, yeah. One of my favorite cozy witch things is the very secret society of irregular witches. I've, I've talked about that one on the podcast before. And I definitely like reading my witchy books or kind of paranormal ghosty books this time of year. Yeah, I um, went through a big, I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but I was big into the Twilight uh, <laughs> books and movies back in the day. <laughs> uh, I think I even saw the, the third movie twice in one day. <laughs> I went to the midnight release and then um, the next like 11 a.m. performance went to it. So, so yeah, I'm not proud of all my choices in life, but um, big into vampires. Um, and I was a children's and teen librarian mm-hmm. at that time. And that was like the golden age of, you know, kind of creepy paranormal. Oh, um, yeah. That like, was like roaring for a while. Yeah. All so, stuff. you know, the Twilight and um, Shiver series and the Raven Boys by, I think, Maggie Stev- Stephenheimer or something. Steve Fader yeah, or something. The Diviners yeah. by Libba Bray. So, yeah, I, I do like some good paranormal okay well i think it's starting to come back in that romanticy genre to me it seems like a lot of that ya things that are kind of been adultified if you will if that's even gotten much more spicy yes Yes. definitely the spice factor has been ratcheted up yes so so the one thing i don't like is claire does not do horror Mm. no horror for Mm. claire you know, my college roommates learned, like, I think, you know how in college you go to see these scary movies, and I would just be terrified of nightmares, and they're like, nope, cutting you off, not not going there anymore. Now, have you read, read much more? I can't do that either, because I just have too vivid of an imagination, and even though I think I'm fine when I'm reading it, mm-hmm. it comes back in dreams. Hmm. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. yeah, I used to think that maybe horror wasn't my thing, but I've kind of started reading it a little bit, and I find as long as it's not something that can happen to me like if it's paranormal mm-hmm. i i'm you know might be a little bit atmospheric or creepy but doesn't bother me okay it's not not going to happen to me don't care <laughs> all right so the first one i have is is one of my seasonal favorites like a warm and witchy novel um and this one is called playing the witch card by kj delantonia And this author is the author of The Chicken Sisters, which I just saw is a movie or show on the Hallmark Channel. I have not watched it, and I have not read this book. Um, But this one was marketed as The Gilmore Girls Meets Practical Magic, which I think has been the descriptor for almost every witch book published recently, you know. I have never watched The Gilmore Girls. (laughs) Oh, that's that's like a perennial favorite, but... um, Yeah, so I think it's like the small town vibes that they're Mm -hmm. trying to, you know, recapture. But here's the setup for this one. We've got Flair Hardwick, and she has just left her cheating husband, who (laughs) cheated with a babysitter. Of course. Of course he did. Um, She moves to Kansas to take over her grandmother's bakery. One thing I've always noticed in these books is these people always inherit like a house or a bakery or something. Uh A Um, bookshop. Yes, yes. Was it in a charming town? Yes, of course it's in a charming town. In the mountains. um, (laughs) So her grandmother had a fortune-telling side hustle. And Flair is kind of reluctant to embrace her magical side. But... When she bakes a batch of tarot-themed cookies <laughs> for the town's huge Halloween event, she just might have unleashed the power of her family's private tarot card deck. It brings her unpredictable mother to town, makes her teenage daughter very curious about magic, and she starts having some friction there. And, of course, it brings back her first love. Uh-huh. Always. Oh. Always. <laughs> And maybe her next love, yeah, the same one and the same. 
But um, but this one turned out a little bit darker than they anticipated. At first, I was thinking kind of like Hallmark for witches movie type thing. But um, there were a lot of family secrets and drama. The town celebrated Halloween in a really big way. It had a special festival. It had a haunted trail that different people in the town were chosen to portray different people or scary things. Um, and even though Flair is trying to escape her magic, it just keeps coming back to her. And it's channeled through this antique deck of tarot cards, which come to find out has a lot of ties to her family life. Her great, 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 great grandmother actually drew these cards. She studied art in Paris and, um, they're from like the Civil War time, so they've been mm -hmm. in her family a number of years. Of course, there's an evil presence in the town. Of course, Flair is going to be called to, you know, defeat said evil presence and save her daughter. Um, but she also is navigating realistic things like custody issues with her ex-husband and, you know, having a teenage daughter and a lot of the trials and tribulations that go along with that. So it wasn't just all silliness, mm -hmm. you know, she's trying to keep her daughter safe. Um, but will she be reconnected with her high school flame? And, you know, will she defeat I all this? I guess yes. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But you'll have to read it and find okay. out. I'm not going to give no. too much away. But, you know, it was a little bit more than what I thought it was going to be. Um, not just a silly witch story. Now, is so. that... And, uh, you probably said, but is that a newer one? Or? No, I think it actually came out last year. Okay, so well, that's that's yeah. pretty new. Um, no, that sounds interesting. I like it when there's there's a bit of realistic in there. I, I tend to be irritated if you know it's all right, about it's, the cozy bakery and the charming um, small town neighbors that become their instant best friends. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. That that gets on my nerves. Okay. Um, so that actually sounds pretty good, and I, I like your name, Flair. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's funny. Um, well, my first book is definitely not on your cozy October read. Um, it does have themes of uh, magical realism and some witchcraft, and I think you read this one as well. It is Wayward by Amelia Hart, and this one came out in 2023, and it actually won two Goodreads um, Choice Awards. Oh, it wow. won yeah. the Best Historical Fiction of 2023 and also the debut novel of 2023. And I think I originally picked up this book... Um, because I did see it on Goodreads, but on the cover. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you recall. It, oh, yeah, you know, it had the, a black raven on the cover with, like, greenery and everything. Yes, with, you know, flowers and yes. insects. And it has a really cool cover. And, yes, librarians, um, we, we do ju judge books by their covers. Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> um, this book uh, weaved together the stories of three women in completely different time periods. And all of these women are connected by one place, which is Wayward Cottage, which is located in the countryside of England. Um, in Cumbria, England. <laughs> the same area where my grandfather grew okay. up, which is yeah. something I mentioned last time, too. Okay, neat. Um, so you kind of get into the, the witchcraft elements early on. Um, one of the characters is named Alpha, and she is living in the year 1619, and she is in prison awaiting her sentence. She is on trial. She's been accused of witchcraft um, and the violent murder of a local farmer. Um, Eltha's mother, we learn, was also a healer, and she relied on plants, natural remedies, and the community was very suspicious of her mother um, back in the day as well. Um, the other character is... Kate and Kate is a modern day woman woman living in 2019 London and she is trapped in a very abusive relationship with her living boyfriend um, she's effectively become a prisoner in her own apartment she has given up her job she's kind of lost contact with um, most of her friends and her family as her boyfriend becomes more and more controlling and what causes her to finally flee this situation is she discovers she's pregnant and she doesn't want her boyfriend to know about it for the safety of herself and um, her unborn child and she flees to 
Wayward Cottage. Wayward Cottage, which was left to her by the long lost Aunt Aunt Violet, who it sounds like she perhaps met maybe once or twice in her childhood, but doesn't really remember. So this cottage, it's old, it's musty, it's very small, the gardens are overgrown and wild, um, but it, it allows her a refuge to try to heal and um, figure out what she's, she's going to do next. Now, the third character is Violet, who is Kate's great aunt, but we follow her story set in 1942, mm-hmm. and Violet is 16 years old at the time, and she is living under you know very controlling father in a great manor house. Right, um, very patriarchal family. Yes, um, and this manor house is very close to Wayward Cottage, and you know Violet is kind of a naive and unusual 16 year old. She wants to climb trees. She's very interested in insects, and um, she resents her younger brother who gets, you know, all the education right. and the opportunities. And of course, being a female in that time period, she she doesn't have that, and she resents it. So we learn more about each woman's story, their secrets, and the things that are connecting them. Um, you know, it's it's a s- historical novel, but it also has these magical realism elements in it. All three of the women are very connected to nature, mm-hmm. um, very into insects, animals, birds. And th- as the reader, you're not quite sure, are they witches? Mm-hmm. Or are they just women who know their way around, you know, plants and right. healing? Yeah. And so you'll have to read it to find out. Um, but I, I enjoyed this book a lot. I thought that each of the the three women had distinct voices and personalities. I originally read it about a year ago, and then I listened to the audiobook this past week, which it's available on Hoopla, so you can get it right away. Um, and I, th- I thought it was really well done. Okay. The, the audiobook, too. Nice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this this one is not a cozy a cozy one. There's a lot of dark themes in it. Um you know, you have no, the, I, like the you violence s- and the abuse and mm. um, stillbirths and murder, but it's, you know, it's kind of a story about the resilience of these three women and how they're interconnected. Yeah, I, I like this one a lot. My daughter and I, I think, picked this one as one of our mother-daughter reads because it was a book of the month club choice, and it might have either been a finalist or one of the top five like books of the year there as well. Yeah. Um, so this this book had a pretty good following, and this author is going to have another book come out in February. It's called The Sirens. Yeah, and it's I saw about that. it's another it's like a dual timeline. Mm-hmm. She must like those multiple timelines, and has themes of sisterhood and kind of sea magic. So I'm yes. very excited about that one too. Yeah, I'm gonna pick that one up for sure. Yeah. All right. So my next book. After playing the witch card, I'm going to jump into... This one is another kind of funny one with serious tones. I'm saving my most serious one for last. Okay. But this is called <laughs> The Love of My Afterlife by Christy Greenwood. And I had this one on my summer preview, and it had a very funny premise. Uh, Delphi has just choked to death on a microwavable hamburger. Right. Yes. <laughs> and it's now That's not a good in way to the go. afterlife waiting room which is designed to look like an old-fashioned laundrette and is manned by a forever 28-year-old woman named Merritt who is training to be an afterlife therapist at Evermore, which is what they call the afterlife. You have to go through training and work in the afterlife? Oh, man. No, no. (laughs) So she starts showing Delphi kind of a flashback, like, what was your life now that you're dead? Um, and it goes it sounds depressing well it was <laughs> it goes from a happy childhood to sad bullied high school years and Delphi choosing mainly she chooses to live by herself she does have some connections she's got an elderly neighbor that she checks on but um, you know there's no real romance there's no real interconnections in her life so shortly after the video The door of the laundrette opens, and bam, here comes this man, Jonah, who is good-looking, he has a great personality, and he seems to talk a lot to Delphi. She has this instant connection. And then, poof, 
he's gone because it turns out he was a mistake. So he was sent back down to Earth, and now Delphi is there. So her therapist in training decides that if Delphi can go back and get him to kiss her for real and have a relationship oh, with geez. this man in 10 days, that she will be able to return to Earth. You know, because she's only like 28, I think. Oh, but um, so this sounds really preposterous, and it is fun, but it didn't really turn out the way that you think it is. It has a 4.14 average on Goodreads from over 22,000 ratings. That's pretty good. Um, which is pretty good, yeah. yeah. So Delphi, even though this is kind of preposterous setup, she really undergoes a lot of great character change and insight when she goes back to Earth. Mm -hmm. She is trying to find this man, but then she starts to realize the people around her may have had different connections, and maybe she's kind of secluded herself too much, and she starts to realize that there may be some connections with the people in her life in her own building. Um, and there are some unusual... So maybe she doesn't need the guy. Right, but but she <laughs> but, still has to. But this is a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so I don't want to go too much into what happens in the plot, but it feels like while she's going around with all these different misfits all around London, there's a lot of different adventures packed in. There's a lot of allusions to romance novel themes and tropes, mm -hmm. kind of paying homage to that in a tongue-in-cheek way, so to speak. Um, and just how to live your life to the fullest. So I thought it was very sweet, life-affirming, and it's just a feel-good read. Um, like I said, it doesn't end up like it's not cookie-cutter ending, but um, I enjoyed it, and I think there were one or two people on book chat that mentioned this book. Um, I'm that, not sure, maybe, yeah. but no, that, that sounds... Fun. Right? Yeah, it was. It was kind just of just the fun. fact that it's a microwavable hamburger. Like, <laughs> oh, I know. What a horrible way to go. <laughs> kind of shows you that it's got a little bit of a little bit of snark and humor there right. that I yeah. think I would I would enjoy. Yeah. Um, well, my second book is uh, not witches. It is vampires, and it Ooh. says that right on the cover. So I'm not giving anything away. Um, it's a brand new release called So Thirsty, and it's written by a local author, Rachel Harrison. And um, this book is labeled horror, but again, I personally found it pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fun read, and uh, I just watched something about the horror genre, um, a webinar, and they said that Rachel Harrison is actually a good kind of gateway author, like an okay. entry point into it, so that even if you don't usually read horror, you, you might enjoy this. So Claire might be able to read Rachel Harrison. I think so. Okay. Um, it, it definitely has some gory bits, but it's it's really kind of a funny, fast read. Um, but here's the setup. So it takes place um, right around here, uh, mm. somewhere around Rochester. And she, Sloane, is a 30-something-year-old woman. And she has crafted quite the mundane and safe existence for herself. Um, kind of sounds like the last character uh, in the right. book that you just discussed. She's kind of isolated herself a little bit and um, made her life as safe and comfortable as possible. Is she happy? Maybe not. Her job is remote and pretty boring. Her marriage is uh, mediocre at best. Um, and, you know, when she looks in the mirror, she kind of feels like every year that passes, some more of, like, her soul is, is leaking away. Um, every Saturday, she vacuums and does laundry, and around noon goes to Wegmans, mm. which I was like, whew, Wegmans! <laughs> um, buys the same, same foods every week. And um, she's been friends... Her best friend is named Naomi. They've been friends since they were young teenagers. And Naomi seems to live a completely opposite existence. She is traveling the world. She's um, dating the lead singer of a rock band. She works for the band. I wonder if Sean knows this person. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, she goes to crazy parties and does drugs and all, all sorts of you know, it seems like fun jet setting things. Uh, maybe she's not all that happy either though. So these two unlikely ladies are best friends and Sloane's husband gifts Sloane a all expenses paid 
getaway to the Finger Lakes for Sloan's birthday. Now, you might wonder why Sloan's husband doesn't want to spend her birthday with her. Is he a selfless great guy or does he want her out of the house? Eh, that becomes um, pretty apparent. But um, so Naomi and Sloan are going on this weekend getaway and that's kind of where the action starts. Naomi wants Sloan to break out of her comfort zone, live a little, you know, why are you being so safe? And so she drags Sloan out to a bar the first night they're there where they, of course, meet a mysterious Russian gentleman and his friends. (laughs) Yes. And like I said, right on the cover, it says vampire novel. (laughs) And they invite them to go to a party at their big lake house. Um, I think this was Auburn, New York, in the Finger Lakes. Um, The very next night, Sloan has grave misgivings about this whole plan, and she's pretty much proven right immediately when they get there, the gate to the driveway of the lake house clangs shut and locks, and like, and (laughs) some things happen, some life-altering, choices are made and the rest of the novel is kind of um, what's been described as like a Thelma and Louise vampire style (laughs) as these two (laughs) friends you know kind of take off on a road trip and you know there's some gore there's some hmm, slightly disturbing things but but really it's the main a little bit of vampire romance of course Mm -hmm. the main part is these two friends kind of coming to terms with their relationship and their past and what they want out of life in the future. And I really thought it was fun. Um, I, I like this author. This is the second thing that I've read by her. And like I say, I, I did not find it scary at all. I but think she has a witch book, too, that I, I'm tempted to read now. Yeah. Cackle. I think and she has going, a werewolf one okay. as well. I think the return cackle, something about bad sharp sheep. teeth. Bad sheep is um, okay. Yep, that's a all right. A good one too. That's black sheep. Black, black sheep. sheep. That's okay. the one that that I read. And again, not scared. Maybe once someone writes a vampire book about a blood sucking vampire targeting an obese middle aged woman, maybe then I'll be scared. But I haven't seen that yet, so there's zero chance. You feel safe. Yeah, yeah. Zero chance of this happening to me, even though I could go to the Finger Lakes, too, quite That's quickly. Right. Yeah, no. Okay. My last book is called The Witches of El Paso by Luis Jaramillo. And I'm always really surprised when I read a book that is the point of view of, of women written by a man. Um, Especially a witch one. Yes, uh, this one kind of reminded me a little bit, totally different culture and everything, but do you remember the golden, oh, the, the Memoirs of a Geisha? I think it was somebody I golden. Read it. Oh, I, I love yeah. that book. And that one was another one. It was very much a whole women's culture and situation. You know, again, Arthur Golden, that was his name. Okay. Um, but I thought, I thought he did a really good job. Um, but this one is kind of that Spanish or magical realism mm-hmm. type of thing. A little bit of time travel thrown in here. Possibly witches. Um, the first story starts out. It's another one that has a dual timeline. 1943, El Paso, Texas. Uh, teenager Nina spends her days caring for the small children of her older sisters. She's longing for her own life, a life of adventure, And she starts having these premonitions and fainting spells. She's had them since childhood, but they begin to get worse the closer she becomes, you know, gets to puberty. Um, She's really worried that she's going to end up like the old witch down the street. So she's praying for help. Always a concern. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. And the mysterious Sister Benedicta arrives late one night. And Nina decides to follow her across the borders of space and time, and she ends up in colonial Mexico. Um, There she discovers the power of La Vista, and she finds out that finding love and learning magic comes with a price. So 
the present day, we have Nina's grandniece, who is Marta. She is a legal aid practitioner. She's trying to balance motherhood with two children. Um, she's caring for the now 93-year-old Nina, so she's kind of in that sandwich generation. Okay. Um, so they're actually starting to look like, what are we going to do with great aunt Nina? Does she go into a home? Like what is going to happen? Her own husband is less than thrilled about any of these alternatives. Um, so Marta agrees like one time after having a conversation with Nina, Nina has convinced her that she had a child who was now trapped in another dimension. Okay. And she agrees to help her find her. Okay. So, because she is also starting to have symptoms of, you know, that she's been wondering about, like, <laughs> um, do I have this gift of second sight? You know, what is going on? What are these feelings? That's so, Lavista. yes, yeah. yeah. So, when the way this author writes, you can almost smell like the magical stews and the horrible smells that come with these curses. It's like the atmosphere and the settings were so evocative. Like you, you just felt like you were there. Um, like they, at one point he was talking about the smell of unwashed bodies and cocoa and all these different things um, and describing like the local flora and fauna mm -hmm. and everything. Um, so it, it really, it makes you feel like you're transported to this other world which I really enjoyed. And if you enjoy like a Western setting and family drama, which I really do, like I loved, um, oh, what was, I can't think of it now, the classic, classic Western, Lonesome you know. Lonesome Dove. Not a Lonesome Dove, but the one, the, I just it was named a movie the one Western with, I know. Yeah, I'll think of it. But anyway, um, and I liked how this author portrayed the complicated relationships between these women. So they're not all sugar and spice and everything nice women. These are women that feel resentment. They have desires. Um, the men in the book are not to be trusted a lot of times. So this, there was this u very unique like push and pull amongst these characters. And the family had a very matriarchal kind of setting to it mm -hmm. you know where the women held the power and like the knowledge of this spiritualism which i thought was very interesting too so i gave it four stars because the one thing the author did do that kind of confused me a little bit is he jumped around in these time periods and until i could kind of figure out where i was and what yeah. was happening it was a little bit confusing for me and i felt like you really needed to pay attention um but that was like one of the only this is that I had about this book. So um, now have, has he written other things or? I think he wrote like a book of short stories, but okay. I believe this may be like one of the first books he's actually written. And he went to like the school of the Suwanee, which I think is a Tennessee or something. Mm. I, I don't know. I found his background very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, I would definitely read another book by him if I could find one. Okay. Um, and they compared it a lot to something of Orkina Davidia, another kind of witch book that kind of had those different generations and everything. Um, and I thought that was a pretty good comparison too. Hmm. Well, that one sounds, sounds interesting and it yeah. kind of um, ties in a little bit to my next one. But I also think, you know, you talk about like the female resentment and the, the patriarchy, like that's, one of the main things about these these witch books, mm -hmm. I actually learned a new term, um, which I can barely say, witcherature. Oh, <laughs> yes, which basically is witch lit. Which that's the term I'm going to stick with because I'm like, am I saying Worcestershire sheer sauce? Like I, I can't <laughs> even pronounce it. But witcherature, um, you know, and and basically uh, one of the authors that I think you've read, Madeline Miller. Uh, Circe, mm -hmm. she has a quote that I, I thought was great, that a witch is a woman with more power than men have felt comfortable with. Oh. Like that's, that's all a witch is. Um, so the third book I read kind of taps into this, this female rage. It's called uh, The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Har Harrow. And this one came out, I think, four or five years ago. And that's when I read it. And I actually remember it, which is unusual for 
you know, years to pass and right. me to still remember anything about a book. Um, and this one is definitely the most fantasy out of any of the three that I read for this. Um, and it's long. It, it clocks in at over 500 pages. And it is set in an alternate historical America. So it's like an alternate reality. And it's 1893. And this story blends together history, magic, and a lot of social justice themes. But anyways, in this alternate history, witches used to be a real thing in this America. They had power. Um, but sometime in the not so distant future, most of them got burned got shut down, um, and now society, there's still some magic there, but it's all very hidden and in the shadows mm -hmm. and, and small. You know, they're, they're saying, like, nursery rhyme words to do, you know, little spells, like household things, like how to make your water not boil over, how to not have wrinkles in your sheets. So the women have kind of lost their their power mm -hmm. and in this story in 1893 one of the ways that the women are trying to regain their power is through trying to get the the right to vote so it follows three sisters the eastwood sisters and in 1893 um there's the youngest sister who's named juniper and she is the angriest sister of the bunch. Her two older sisters kind of abandoned her seven years prior. They had a very abusive and horrible father, and the older sisters, in trying to get away from this situation, left Juniper behind. Oh, no. So Juniper is feeling betrayed and, you know, kind of kind of has some rage going on. The oldest sister is named Bella, and she kind of leads a quiet life uh, as a librarian at Salem College, and she is searching for magic through books and, you know, records, old records. And then the middle sister is Agnes, and she's described as, like, the strongest and the steadiest sister. And she is in a soul-crushing job as, like, a factory mill worker. Um, you know, the alternate history is very is very true to, like the real American history, you know, there's mill workers, the Triangle Factory uh, fire, the suffragette movement. Um, but anyways, Agnes has just found out that she is pregnant out of wedlock. So after seven years of being apart, these three sisters are kind of all end up in the same place. And they are trying to work through their differences to bring back witchcraft to the world and to get the right to vote. And, of course, there's, you know, an evil presence in the town that's um, working against them through fear and politics and maybe some of their own magic. But this book, it, it takes a lot of kind of, I wouldn't say complicated, but it's packing a lot in there. Mm -hmm. It's got uprising, secret societies, social justice, there's some romance, all the witchcraft, and throughout this complicated relationship between these three sisters who, you know, at the beginning, like, they weren't even really speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. So um, this one was, was an interesting one. I, I think I gave it five stars, like four and a half, rounded up. It dragged a little bit in the middle, kind of lost something there, but... Um, I thought it was, was a really good book. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah. I think she wrote another one called The 10,000 Doors of January. Did you read that one? No, I haven't read anything else by her, and I, I need to. Um, she's also, uh, I think, Sparrow, Sparrow something or other, Starling, Starling House. Oh, I read that. I'm pretty sure yeah. it's the same author. Okay. Sean will hopefully fact check that so that we're yeah. <laughs> not giving out wrong wrong titles and authors. I'm still um, thinking about that Western. It was the Rooster Cogburn, the daughter going. True grit. Yes. Yes. Oh, True okay. Grit. Yes. Yeah. No, it didn't. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> um, read that multiple times and love like the newer movie of that too. So, well, we've got some great books here. If you're yeah. into the kind of witchy or paranormal, you know, we'd love to hear what your favorites are. 
thank you so much for joining us. As always, sure. I'm going to have the links to the books that we talked about in our show notes. And next episode, I'm going to be talking about books with fellow librarian Lisa and just doing a reading roundup of some of the things we've been reading lately. So hard to believe, but we're already starting to think about our best books of 2024 mm -hmm. and what's going to be on our list. And I'm actually starting to think a lot about what I'm going to read in 2025 and setting some I always set a goal for myself, a numeric goal, but this time I think I'm going to do something different and do some more like intentions of reading. So um, I might even do a physical reading journal instead of just oh. tracking them all online. So I'd love to hear how other readers track their books, see if they have a method for making yeah. reading more satisfying or more personalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, mine, I just track them on Goodreads. I'm, I think at 91 books for the year, I'm going to blow through my 100 yeah. Hundred book goal. I really need to get a life, um, but yeah, sounds yeah, good. I think I'm in the 80s now, but yeah, and I always try to shoot for 100. But um, yeah, so comment on our Facebook or YouTube if you have any suggestions for us, or if there's any themes that you would like us to see us cover in oh. 2025. Yeah, I'll read are, anything. Give, yeah. give me a genre. And We're I'll always dive up in. for new ideas. I think we need to make Claire read some some horror but maybe not if it gives her nightmares maybe we'll do like you pick me i pick you type thing okay or maybe uh we can let the listeners pick what we should read yeah <laughs> yeah do a grab bag but um but so thank you from so much for joining us and we'll see you in november as we continue on for for the year thanks so much thanks book break is a production of the greece public library made possible through the support of the friends of the greece public library Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.